how did we get to where we are now? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go really fast through the negative stuff because we heard a lot of that already. So, yeah, everybody's seen these pictures where there was a lot of profiteering back in the 1800s and we just went in there. You know, when the, when the Europeans got here, they came and looked at all this, this land of plenty. Buffalo, elk, and deer, plenty of food. And they said, let's kill it, okay? And we'll plow all the land, and then we'll do what we want. We'll get nature, we'll beat nature into submission, right? So we over-harvested. This is the, uh, I thought this was pretty interesting, that a lot of people don't realize there were bison all over here in Pennsylvania at one time. So that's the original bison range. And on, on the other side is the original elk range. There are elk everywhere. And and then you've all seen this picture of the buffalo skulls, right? So they killed all the bison. And then we brought diseases over here. Got rid of the American chestnut. Can you imagine the, the, the plentiful nuts that were here when we had beech nuts, oaks, and chestnuts all at the same time? And then, of course, we have the gypsy moth, and I can say gypsy moth because my wife is actually a Russian gypsy. And so when I told her that we had to call it the spongy moth, she burst out of half of so she's not the least bit offended. But we have the uh, crazy weather going on, which I think brings forth a lot of these other problems with oaks. And we continue to have high deer herbivory, you know, for a, you know, from, from about 1930 to 1990, somewhere in there, uh, we had just like ever increasing deer herds. They ate themselves out of house and home. This is a uh, typical forest floor, uh, no brush, no regen, and full of Japanese stillgrass. So that's what we're dealing with right now. Yeah. Uh, and then living around here, you've all seen the Susquehanna River running like chocolate milk. There's a, uh, a plume of, there, there goes your topsoil down into the Chesapeake Bay, and there's an algal bloom there. It's not too good for the aquatic species down there. So we went from the large clear cuts and the burning of the slash uh, and the killing off of the deer brought forth an oak forest, and that's why we have an oak forest today. However, the um, high grading of oaks over the last 50 years has uh, reduced the, the oak and the quality of the oak, okay? And then we have a deer selected forest at this time because the deer pretty much ate everything that, uh, that they like and the only thing growing is what deer don't eat, so. But that's enough gloom and doom. I wanna get into some solutions. Who's old enough to know this picture, okay. There we go. We got some old people in here. So, uh, what are the habitat needs of all wildlife? They need space, okay. And you heard uh, a speaker earlier talking about how you have to have continuous forest so that animals can move and migrate as they need to do. We need space. We need food and water, and we need cover. Everybody needs to get away from predators and have a place to safely feed and breed and rest. So deer, we're all interested in deer. Who hunts deer in here? Yeah, like, I don't know, 60% of you. Deer have to, they live from like this height down, okay? Unless you're talking about acorns, which is just a seasonal food supply, you need to have plenty of, of food from shoulder height down. We don't have a lot of that right now. They eat browse. They eat, the, they eat leaves, twigs, buds, fruit, okay, and forbs that are growing on the ground. We need to have forest openings for deer, and we can either have food plots or we could have native <coughs> foraging that's open. And deer, of course, need a place to hide. You know, a deer, their life is pretty boring, really. They go to one place to eat, or they wander around and forage, then they go to a safe place to chew their cud and rest. And that's pretty much the life of the deer until breeding season. So we need to supply those places for them to do that if you want to have a lot of deer. Turkey, on the other hand, turkey 
in the same general area need to have some roosting trees. They need good places to nest. They need good places to forage. And, you know, the most important thing of all is brood rearing habitat. What does that look like? Well, if a, if a turkey poult is the size of a baseball, it needs to be able to run around and escape predators. They need to go fast. They need to catch insects. Number one in importance for a deer turkey poult or a turkey poult is to be able to feed on a lot of insects, get that protein in size so they can fly away and get away from predators. So as you can see, this poult here is in perfect habitat. There is low growth there. There's a variety of plants. There's probably a lot of insects for, for that turkey to eat. And it's tall enough that they could crouch down and scoot and get away. Okay, now grouse and woodcock, on the other hand, they need new forest growth. They need very high stem count forest, and that comes from disturbance. Disturbance could be fire, wind throw, and it could be harvesting. But as you can see, a grouse needs to have a lot of dense cover behind him when he's drumming, because he make a lot of noise and action, and if he doesn't have that cover, he's gonna get picked off by a hawk. A woodcock, on the other hand, they need wet soils, they need thickets, and in close proximity, they need a forest opening. They need to have a meadow to do their mating flights. Then we have the songbird. Where would we be without the songbirds in the spring? You know, they're a major part of enjoying nature, and these birds all have overlapping niches that they occupy. So if you want a lot of birds, you need a lot of variety in your forest cover. For instance, the oven, the oven bird needs closed canopy woods. They nest on the ground and feed on the ground. They like to have large, uh, mature, closed canopy forest. And then the wobblers, the, the gold-wing warbler, needs to have both high oak canopy to feed in and thick brush to nest in on the ground. So you can see where it's very important to have a lot of diversity on the property. So how do we fix habitat on these small properties like what you guys have? Regeneration of the forest is probably the, the number one thing you can do to increase wildlife habitat and improve the timber on your property. So one thing we could do is develop young forests to encourage forts and low cover and new trees. We could do timber stand improvement harvesting. And you could do that either with uh, a, a non-commercial thinning, a commercial thinning, or you could just go out with a chainsaw and do some thinning on your own. You can use hack and squirt, you probably know about that. How many people have used their own herbicide applications in their woods? That's good. So uh, we have shelter woods, seed tree, clear cuts. We have group tree select. There's a lot of uh, alternatives. One thing you don't see on my list is select cut. Why, why is that? Because most of the time when people say select cut, they mean high grade. You're selecting the best trees and leaving the rest. Um, that's a short video that I'm not going to do for time constraints. Okay, reintroduce native mass shrubs. So a lot of these shrubs are missing from the landscape. And what I do is when I'm working on a property, one of the things I put in my plans is to reintroduce these shrubs. So any kind of dogwood is great for deer. And anything that produces fruit, of course, is great for birds and other wildlife. These are all native and readily available from nurseries. You can always pick them up. And you can also go out and collect your own seeds and make a hobby out of propagating these things. Anytime that you put up a, a deer-proof fence, which I, I do a lot of in my work, um, the first thing you want to do, now that deer are excluded, you want to get in there and plant as much diverse cover as you possibly can. Get as many plants in there as possible while the deer can't kill them, okay? 
Planting mass trees. You know, all these trees are native. Uh, if you don't do anything else on your property uh, and you want to leave something for future generations, let's get the American chestnut back. You can get nuts, you can, you can plant them. I have some trees that I planted 15 years ago from a parent tree out of Michigan that didn't have the blight. They're doing great. They're 30 feet tall and they're about 8 inches in diameter already. So it's possible to get American chestnut back. Uh, down in this region, you, I, I run into these pawpaw trees every once in a while. Just a little bit north of here, I, the first time I ever saw one, I was in the woods, I was up on a ridge, and I saw this tree, I didn't know what the heck it was. <clears throat> it was a pawpaw, so I know it'll grow around here. I don't see it north of Seven Mountains, but I see it around here. So these are all good plants that, that animals will spread the seed. If you could just get them started, animals will take over and spread that seed around. Prescribed fire is probably the best bang for the buck. I mean, if you can, some, we need to get prescribed fire back on the landscape, period. You gotta do it. You gotta figure out how we can do it. I was down working in Georgia. In Georgia, you can, call up the county and say, hey, I want to burn. Yep, okay. So they come out and they help you and they charge you like a hundred bucks and, and you can set up a burn, they'll light it for you and if everything looks good, they just take off. You know, We make too much of a big deal about it, okay? So I'm not 100% sure this will work here. Let's try it. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> So I was down in Texas at a meeting with uh, Dr. James Kroll down there on his facility, <clears throat> and we got down with the meeting. He said, "Hey, let's go burn. It's a good day to burn." So we went out and we made a fire break and lit one off. And as you can see, it's pretty laid back. Okay, there's a guy there with a flapper. There's James's uh, grandson. He's really into being an army man. So you can you can get an idea of how easy and simple that that is. Okay. All right. That's what it looked like when it really got going. And he burned so often that the, the local uh, fire department they they know if the smoke is coming from his place and know it's him. I don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, and then we all know about food plots. Um, food plots are great because you can get as much forage in one acre of food plot, if you do it right, as 100 acres of closed canopy forest. So if you want to feed a lot of animals, a food plot is a good way to go. Native forbs. Okay. A lot of you probably have farms that have pasture. I don't really know how many farmers do we have here. Just a few, really. So uh, some of these cool season grasses that we brought from Europe aren't really good for the plant communities that are in our fields. If you have a place that's an old field or a pasture that you're not using, it might be a good idea to spray those grasses out, burn them, or lightly disc them, and all of these seeds, I guarantee you, every one of those is in the seed bank and they'll come forth. You can also buy seed if you go to Ernst Seed Company. Uh, you can buy a lot of these species from them. And you can start, you can actually start a forage, a native forage food plot if you want. So, I think some of you were waiting for me to talk about food plots, so we're gonna we're gonna get into the food plots. We'll start with the food plot principles. What I do with food plots is a little different. I focus on soil health first. So we want to keep living roots in the soil at all times. <coughs> we want to start building up our organic matter and take care of the biology that's below the ground as well as the biology above the ground. Food plots 
keep in mind they're only supplemental to proper forest management. You can't build a deer herd with food plots. You have to manage your forest correctly because they're always going to browse. They need the, the food that's in the forest first. That's what they're born and bred to do, what they evolved to do. So food plots are supplemental. Keep forage available all year round. So I see a lot of a lot of landowners when I go to visit their property that have a clover plot. <clears throat> so think of it this way. If I said to you, you know, I'm gonna feed you prime rib and turkey in the holidays, and then the rest of the year. I'm gonna give you tofu and potatoes, okay? You're not gonna like it. So deer don't like that either. So keep something really palatable and nutritious on the ground at all times. I always use multi-species and multi-season cover crop mixes for my food plots, and I'll explain why. <clears throat> All right, let's get back to the soil. The soil is alive. There's more life below the surface than what's above the surface. This uh, graphic, don't worry about it. I could probably zoom in, but don't worry about it. It just shows the, the, uh, the food web that is in the soil. So you have different uh, tropic levels of, of animals that you know, as you go up the food chain, you get into the higher forms of life above the ground. And the whole thing is a process that goes in a circle, right? So down here in the left, we have a root hair with mycorrhizal fungi coming out of it. And what happens there is that uh, those fungi attach to the root. Some of them go in, that's the ar arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. If you could spell that, I'll give you a prize. <laughs> and they go out and find nutrients and minerals and bring it back to the root. We also have bacteria that will go into that root hair, shed its, uh, its outer layer, its cell wall, and deliver uh, nutrients to the plant. <clears throat> and then it, comes, it actually comes back out. Up in the upper right, we have paramecium grazing on bacteria in a fungal net, okay? So all this is happening right around the root, the roots, okay, of the plant. And, and down here we have a rotifer eating a paramecium. So every time you go up the food chain, one, one rung up the ladder, you release nitrogen right near the roots. And that's how uh, plants get their nutrients. They don't get it from a fertilizer bag. <clears throat> Um, this is a fascinating video of what is that? Anyhow, take a look at what's going on there. The, this is a uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and the nutrients and liquids are moving in two directions. So there's there's carbon coming in from the photosynthesis going to the roots out and feeding that microbiome and then the microbiome they're in a symbiotic relationship they're bringing things back to the plant okay anyhow I could talk all day on soil health all right Okay, so locating your food plots. The best place, of course, is an already existing field or a previously planted field that somebody already <coughs> picked the rocks out and you picked a good spot. You know, you know that if you have a pine plantation that somebody had had that in pasture years ago. So that's a good place to start. You always wanna check your soil survey for what kind of soils you're using or, or have there and see if it's suitable. Don't struggle with a location that won't work. If it's too wet, too stony, uh, you only have a few inches of bedrock, it's not gonna work. So the next thing you have to worry about is if you're 
if you want to observe deer, if you want to have deer come to where you want them to be, you put your, you put your uh, bedding areas that you can create on one side, and you put your food plots on the other side and hunt them in between. <coughs> you always want to test and amend your soil. First thing I do after I clear a spot, grab a soil test. It only costs 10 bucks and gives you everything you need to know. The most important thing is your pH and you, you can correct that very easily with the lime application. Get your pH up to six and a half, you can pretty much grow anything you want. I apply a lot of compost in my food plots because it can build, especially if I have really poor soil. And I want to build up that, that organic matter in my soil. I only use fertilizer to get things started. Once you get a good system going, you're not going to need fertilizer anymore. In fact, you should wean yourself off of fertilizer as much as you possibly can. You should minimize tillage as much as you possibly can. And all your, uh, your what we call sides, your herbicide, pesticide, etc. Use cover crops, and I'm getting now into the compost extracts. So we're gonna make compost, and we're gonna take uh, extracts from that, and apply that to my seeds, and we're gonna apply it foliar as well, later on in the year to help the biota in the soil. <coughs> and that's gonna give you really healthy, nutritious plants. I did an experiment last year where I I planted two fields the exact same way, same size, same area. Uh, I put compost extract on one and not on the other. The deer ate the one with the compost extract. I mean, that's not a, a scientific uh, peer-reviewed paper or anything. It's just my, my observation. I'm gonna experiment with that some more. So what to plant? Let's get into the plants. We can do perennials, warm season, cool season. We can do two season rotations, which is what I try to, to, uh, to get going on a property. And we can establish native plants, as we said before. Clovers can be annuals like these. Uh, these are typical annuals that we use a lot. Crimson is very popular up here. Uh, Balanza clover is a good uh, reseeding annual. And these, uh, Crimson and Balanza, will uh, go to flower and go to seed very early in the, in the summer. And you can actually, once the seeds ripen, even though they're annuals, you can actually uh, run that down with uh, uh, light disking and replant your field. Okay? Red clover, you know, red clover is actually a biannual, so Usually, we use it as, we consider it a perennial, even though it's really a biannual, but uh, most of the time, your perennial food plots, when you're talking clover, you're talking white clover. So white clover comes in many varieties. You can get uh, Durana, Ladino. I use this Alice clover. I swear by it. It's excellent. Um, this, uh, this picture is of a white clover field with chicory mixed in. And you can see how, how the, uh, the exclusion cage keeps deer off of it so you can see how it's actually growing. You always want to use an exclusion cage so that you know whether, you know, a lot of times people will say, hey, my, my stuff didn't grow. But if you don't put an ex exclusion cage in, deer are like lawnmowers. They do a nice job of evenly clipping off everything. So sometimes you think, your stuff isn't growing, but it is. The deer is just eating it. So we have annuals. We have fall and summer annuals. And I use cover crop cocktails. So as you can see, uh, that's one of my fields. And plants grow better when they're planted together. You can get more biomass by far the more species you put in up until studies have shown that seven or eight plants is where it starts to, to level off. And you know, as you go up in, in numbers of plants, the biomass goes up and up until you get to about eight and it starts to level off. So I try to use eight, nine plants. And 
the reason that you get more biomass is because your your leaves are all different shapes and sizes and your plants are different heights so you're collecting more sunlight all you're really doing when you plant something is is you're farming sunlight you get the photons into the plant down into the roots Root structures are different too. They all have different sizes and shapes. Some of them go really deep and pull nutrients and water up and they can share that with the other plants and you get a lot more bang for your buck with all those different sized roots. This is a summer mix that I use. Um, there's a picture of it there. There's three legumes. There's five broad leaves in that mix and one grass. Now I can plant that in the spring, like around the end of May, and I can go all the way until frost with that. But what I usually do, I try to terminate that and plant my fall food plot right into it. And as you can see, if you, if you wanna help out pollinators, there are a lot of flowers in these. Fall food plot cocktail might look like this. I plant a lot of wheat. That's probably your best, cheapest. Uh, you can get more out of wheat than just about anything. I always use onless wheat, and I always use untreated wheat because the, the pesticides that they put on seeds today are being eaten by turkeys and crows, and, and who knows? I, I, they probably, turkeys are on the decline, so we have to think about, oh, I gotta get moving here. Anyway, collards are the best brassica, and Austrian winter peas are can't miss. That's that, those deer field of oats. That's in December. There's what I mean about the hornless wheat. This uh, this picture is from a field that was planted in strips of regular wheat and hornless wheat. The darker areas are where the deer ate all the seeds off. They don't like the the regular wheat. Okay. I'm going to skip on down. All right, this is just a, a quick chart. Don't get too worried about what's what there, but just get an idea of the fact that the the uh, the winter wheat comes on strong there in the fall. There's two critical periods. One is right now, and one is late summer when forage starts to harden off and it's not as nutritious anymore. So we have wheat and crimson clover comes on real strong in the fall. It stays pretty palatable all through the winter, and then you get a pulse of it in the spring. Chicory kind of goes heavy in the spring, and then it kind of stays real nice. Chicory is a good thing to have to get that carrot root down, so when you have dry weather, it'll, it'll find moisture and bring it up and stay palatable. And those are your summer legumes, where that's where most of the nutrition is in a food plot and, and that's when the deer need it the most. Okay, when you're growing antlers and fawns and feeding fawns milk. <coughs> I'm gonna skip over the maintenance. Let's get into case studies. This is a project that I just started. Uh, it's a farm that's been really abused. The soil's in terrible condition. We have compaction, uh, low pH, low fertility. So in, in the yellow, we're gonna put uh, warm season grasses all around those fields and we're gonna plant them with cover crops and start building that soil back up. We put a lot of lime on. Down in the lower left is 15 acres of open hardwoods. And you can see that we're marking the leaf trees and we're gonna take everything else out but the leaf trees. So those are the quality trees that we want to be there for seed. This is a project that we actually uh, applied for EQIP. We got a lot of funding. Uh, we got real lucky with this, and usually you don't you don't have that much success. I mean, it, it, it does take a lot of time to go through this process, and but we did get funding for the management plan that I wrote. I applied herbicides to the ferns. We got two fences put up on this property. 
and we got TSI done. And there's a list of things that they don't want to cover, and hopefully one day we can apply for RX funding, or RX burn funding. There's a map of the property. Uh, you can see that down in, in the lower right, there are clear cuts there. So a, far, a forester that worked on this property before decided that that would be a good idea to do small clear cuts. They're 10 acres each. It was a bad idea because as you can see, the, the, uh, there's a lot of high graded forest all around with uh, closed canopy and there's nothing to eat. So where did all the deer go? And as soon as the stuff started growing back, the deer ate it all down. And I had ferns literally this high when I sprayed it. You couldn't even see where you were going. It was scary because there, we did run into some rattlesnakes and, and, and some wasp nests and whatnot. Luckily, I wasn't the guy that tripped over it. Anyhow, that's kind of what the, you know, we did that clear cut area, then we did another area, and that's before treatment. That's after I sprayed it and thinned it. And there's the guys putting up the deer proof fence. Now, I have the club uh, committed to planting every year. They planted a little bit this year inside the fence, and hopefully they'll just continue that program and get a bunch of guys up there and have planting weekends. I'm gonna skip that. Loser in County, this guy called me about four years ago. He said, hey, I have this piece of ground and I can't hunt on it because it's so thick we don't even go there, we hunt somewhere else. This place was high graded uh, back in the 80s probably. And back then, red oak and cherry was hot, so they took every red oak and every cherry, but they left white oak. So luckily we have some white oak to work with. I've marked all the good quality white oaks to leave, and we took everything else out. The logger wasn't very happy with, with the the quality of the wood, but he had a firewood market. We were able to move some pulp off that property. Skip on down. I, I was on a dozer there, moving stuff off the food plots. We burned a lot of slash. There's a Pocono potato. <laughs> Lots of those out there. <laughs> okay, right here, we're, we're spreading compost and lime. So we got a lot of nutrients out of that compost and built up organic matter, and we put the lime on pretty heavy to straighten out the uh, pH. And then a month later, we have a food plot, and we have, you can see how all of the trees that I left have good crowns on them. Those are mostly white oaks. Come on. Okay, so on the left you see the closed canopy forest, and on the right that's the after picture. There's about nine food plots in there, some trails, and he bought himself a drip torch and we're gonna start hopefully burning in between those roads, okay? Some pictures he sent me like the, the first year after we got this done, that's his first turkey ever. Got a nice buck. There's always bears around up there. He has a bear that looks like a, a black Angus bull up there. And there's about a dozen bucks in that picture and that's really what it's all about right there getting together with your friends and family which is that's my reward okay, for what i do is lots of smiling faces and people having fun with their land again those guys are lucky because there's a game lands right across the street and they stock it with pheasants and uh guys come up from the city and they can't shoot you know they can't hit anything so all the pheasants are going over on his property and they get free stocking is pretty cool. <laughs> this is a pine plantation, and this is what I hope to achieve on that pine plantation. I know I'm running out of time here. So, in conclusion, we're looking to uh, manage.
manage forest, forest with diversity in mind. Always be thinking about your diversity. Don't worry so much about income off your forest. You know, I, I realize that a lot of people want to sell timber when they kind of think it's time and they need some money, but that's not how you should look at it. You should be looking at it, manage it for the long haul. Okay, so long after we're gone, 100 years from now, none of us will be alive anymore, but somebody else could enjoy the fruits of your labors. Always be monitoring what you do so that you understand what works and what doesn't. You can't manage what you don't measure. So take a minute and read this. Because I, I can't read it without well, getting choked up to chew the This is my grandson. <laughs> I worry if I tell that, that he won't have a place that he can enjoy the way I've enjoyed myself in the woods. And I hope that as landowners, you take the responsibility to make sure that long after we're gone, like when his grandchildren are with him in the woods, and, and those kids don't even know who we even were, that they could see a chestnut tree and maybe shoot a deer underneath that chestnut tree eating chestnuts, okay? Um, if you want to call me anytime, please feel free to do so. There's my email. And I have a very complete food plot course. And if you, uh, if you email me, I'll send you a link to it, or you can take a picture of this link and just go to it. And for you guys, I have a, uh, if you use Steve90 discount code, you can uh, get 90% off. So it's only like 47 bucks that way. So. Feel free to, to uh, tap into that information. It's got time, soils, what to plant, equipment, etc. Covers everything about food plots you can ever imagine. So check that out. Um, and then I'll I have a few minutes for questions. If anybody, yeah, you, you have four or five minutes for okay. questions. I guess two, I guess I have two questions. Uh, the first one is with uh, obviously getting into food plots and. Getting like compost and compost mixes, and obviously, like you hear the new thing now that the whole climate kind of thing. I haven't seen articles about us introducing biochar. Yeah, biochar is is interesting. You can, you know, the, the idea behind biochar is the same as compost, where you can uh, get carbon. What we're trying to do is get carbon into the soil. Carbon is what everything's made out of. So the more life you have down there. In a, you need a home for them to live. That's why we need roots in the soil at all times. Now, that carbon will build up over time. In three, four, five years, if you do it right, you can easily increase your topsoil <coughs> and get your soil biology working correctly. Okay. Um, now, CO2 is not a pollution. Okay. It's not a pollutant. It's plant food. If you want to get CO2 out of the atmosphere, if you think that's important, grow stuff because that's where the carbon is going to go. You know, the idea of trying to get carbon out of the atmosphere by not driving a car is ridiculous. What we need to do is fix our soils. If you look at a, at a carbon dioxide map of the United States, you'll see that the carbon dioxide almost disappears in the Midwest in the northern mid Midwest uh, in the middle of summer because the corn is growing. It sucks all that carbon, but the problem is we, we harvest the corn and then what do we do with it? We burn it in our gas tanks. The corn is not food. Okay? Oh, very small amounts of the corn that we plant in this country goes to food. Okay? A lot of it goes to ethanol. And if we can revert back to native prairies with animals on it, we're going to have a healthy biology of the soil. That's a whole other topic that I could give another two-hour speech on. And, you know, I, I would encourage you to go on YouTube University and find information on that. It's very interesting. There's a lot of new science coming out that uh, people are doing some really terrific things with the, uh, the biology underneath the surface of the soil. It's really fascinating. In the back there. What kind of
kind of time frames involved. If you spray an area, kill the grass or whatever, and then to till or to replant seed, you know. It depends. You know, I, I have uh, some areas, I, I didn't get a chance to show you the picture of that, but I have a picture there of a guy who I just cleared the woods and we planted a summer uh, cover crop and he sent me a picture of him and his tractor. I can't see the tractor at all. I can just see the cat. I mean, that stuff grew, it had to be five, six feet tall. And so we had success right away. But if you're in a really bad abused soil or if you have a lot of deer pressure, it's really hard to get things to grow. So that's another thing is that we can put electric fence around or some type of fencing to keep deer out while we grow our food plots. But you can, uh, like say you want to, to uh, kill out some uh, fescue, for instance, you can spray that here this spring as soon as it starts to get about three, four inches tall. And you can drill right through that or you can lightly till and plant, broadcast plant. Um, you know, however you want to plant. Right away, <coughs> right away after you till. There's no time frame after you spray. Yeah, uh, try, if, if you can get away with not tilling, that would be great. Because what happens is you're, every time you till, you set back that soil biology clock. Because you're gonna kill a lot of things when you till. And you're releasing, when you get back to that CO2 issue again, you're releasing a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere when you do that. So we want to keep the life and the carbon that's in the atmosphere. I mean, that's, that's what God's plan was to, uh, you know, a plant is made out of gases. So God's plan is, in effect, we're messing with it. We, we tripped a little bit. We made some mistakes. But it's time to start getting back to working with nature instead of trying to beat it into submission all the time. Well, what I was leading into was like area where still grass was, you know. Oh, we still keep, grass. We yeah. it cut down, but I'm just saying. Still grass, you're, you're, you're going to spend three, four years getting rid of it. So you're going you're gonna to spray, and you're going to think, wow, that worked good. And the next year, it's up to your ass again, because that's just the way still grass is. It's a prolific cedar, really aggressive, and the best thing to do is get rid of it and then replace it with something. Something fast growing. Like what? Oats, wheat, uh, clover. Um, you know, I, I work with a guy right now. He doesn't want any herbicide sprayed on his property. We put pigs in there. The pigs ate all the still grass. And we thought we had a, a good success, right? We put a bunch of oats down, and, you know, it's right back to the way it was. But, you know, but if you don't want to spray, it's really hard to control still grass. I don't know the answer to getting rid of it. I have one guy, he said he was gonna scrape it off with a, a bulldozer, and it's like, well, good luck with that. That's, that's, that's all we have now for uh, questions. Yeah, I'll hang around, around if you guys. Can be around for a little while. Yeah, I'll hang around if anybody has any more questions or needs to know about something. <laughs>